Excellent. Um, I have a podcast, and the microphone is on a stand the whole time, so I don't have to worry about doing this kind of thing. So forgive me if, uh, if you can't hear me. Um, so like Michael said, my name's Ben. Um, I'm a virtual CFO, and I'll tell you what that means a little bit later. But my talk is uh, know your numbers, increase your profits, and stress less. So here's what we're going to go through. We're going to talk about the knowing your numbers bit, and that's important because you can see the main problems and opportunities that are coming up in your business. Some of the things that go wrong in a business or going wrong, you can't actually see any other way or as easily as you can by looking at the numbers. Um, so in the presentation, I'm going to go over the five key ones. Um, thank you for showing up to a numbers talk straight after the uh, after party. You're all hung over, so well done. Um, I'm going to talk about the earn more profit part. More profit is good because it means you have more cash. It also usually means you have more time because you can pay other people for their time or you don't have to work as hard to make as much money. And that generally leads to less stress. So I'm going to talk about five quick ways that you can earn profit in the next week. Um, important housekeeping item, don't write down everything I'm going to say. I will probably talk fast and I'll start talking faster as my time starts to run out. Um, so make sure that you're focusing on the aha moments. So anything that I say and you go, oh, I want you to write that down. Because you may not remember that if you go later look at your notes or if you look at the recording later. So any aha moments you have, anything that you need to do after hearing this talk, write that down as well. And then you can go rewatch the recording later. Once you've done those things and you've processed those aha moments, rewatch the recording and there might be some different ones. Because some of the things that I'm saying, they won't be relevant until later. So you'll need to do some things first. You can also get a copy of the slides. It's on my website. Very easy to remember. It's my name. Just don't put an S on the end of my last name. Thank you, Rachel McAdams, for all those spelling errors people do of my name. Um, benmcadam.me slash WCBNE, which I'm really happy rhymes. So thank you for the acronym of this conference. Um, this uh, link will be on the last slide as well when we do the Q&A. So if you haven't written it down, don't worry. So I'm going to ask you to participate. And I have a poll. How long have you been in business? So put your hand up if you haven't been in business yet or you're thinking about it. Brave souls putting their hands up first, very good. Um, hands up if you've been in business for less than a year. All right, very good. Uh, anyone two to three years? Anyone that's three years plus? Excellent, most of the room, all right. Um, another impromptu question, uh, how many of you are freelancers or are going to be freelancers? And how many of you have a team, whether that's contractors or employees? All right. OK. That helps me give you some more relevant examples in the talk. Sorry to everyone watching at home, you don't get a say. Um, so who am I? My god, that's big. Um, so uh, I'm Ben. I am a virtual CFO. So CFO is like a corporate term for a chief financial officer. It's like a strategic level accountant. So they're the people that look at your numbers. They don't use them to fill out a tax form or something. They look at them and they say, here's how we're going to make things better in the business. So that's what I do. I've sold two businesses in the last two years, um, both of them agencies. Um, one of them was an in online international bookkeeping business that grew pretty fast before I sold it to my co-founder. And I've been doing this for over a decade for a lot of my clients. So plenty of results. Um, but moving on from uh, me talking about myself, what's the goal in this presentation? I want you to keep in mind that this isn't just a general uh, information session where we all enjoy talking about numbers and hearing numbers. I want you to keep in mind your goals. What's the goal for your business? Like, Do you want to maybe exit the business? Do you want to hold the business and just earn some money from it? Are you following a calling? Whatever your goal is for your business, you're going to need some healthy profits and business numbers. Even if you're following a calling or doing something not profit, you need some profits. And I'll tell you why a little bit later. But even the not profit, are there any not profit people in the, in the room? Never mind then. 
Um, the other thing I want you to do is keep your goals in mind. Uh, use them as to help you focus on the important stuff and to filter out the things that aren't so important as I go through this presentation. Okay, so the first part is about the five key numbers. These you can find on your financial statements, so the profit and loss, the balance sheet that your bookkeeper or maybe tax accountant prepares for you, or maybe you do it yourself and you can download them from your accounting software. Um, anybody still putting the numbers together by sending a shoebox to their tax accountant? No one brave enough? No one? Okay. Well, that's good anyway, if you're telling the truth. So the first most important one is sales. I call it sales, but you might see it as revenue or income. Uh, it's really important because if you don't have any sales, there is no business. There's just you spending a lot of money on expenses because it's fun, maybe. The important thing with sales, we want it going up, um, even adjusting for seasonal factors, like it may get quiet over Christmas for some people when you know, all your clients shut down and go on holidays. Or if you're in e-commerce and retail, Christmas could be super busy period. If you're selling um, some products that are more for summer, then you know there may be some quiet periods during uh, spring and autumn. Um, if you can talk to your bookkeeper or tax accountant or do it yourself, keep the different types of sales that you do. So the different products, the different services, have them on separate lines so that you can have a look at the trend for each of them. If you're just looking at one sales line on your report, you might be looking at it and thinking, oh yeah, everything's basically going up, but it could be that you haven't noticed one particular service is, uh, is going down. So having separate lines is important there. To find your sales, it's the top row of your profit and loss statement, um, but you can also find it in a whole bunch of other areas. If you sell online, then whatever system you use to take payment will often have some sort of a report that you can follow there. Number two is margins. You may not know what this means technically if you're talking to an accountant, and I am a recovering accountant, um, that you would call this gross profit margins. Or if you're looking at your financial statements that someone's prepared for you, it might, might say gross profit margin or GP margin. And it's basically a percentage. The profit you earn, uh, the gross profit you earn divided by sales, and I'll talk a little bit more detail later about how to calculate it. But why I say margins, or gross profit margins, with a plural on the end, is because just like in, uh, in the last slide when I was talking about sales, keeping that separate, each of your services, each, each of your products, keeping an eye on those separate, you should have a look at the margins separately as well. So you can make sure that your costs aren't creeping up for a particular product or service line without you noticing because you're just looking at the totals. Margins are pretty important, that's why they're number two. Uh, without sales, there are no margins, but they're number two because this is like the 80-20 of profitability. If you only take away one thing from this talk, it's this slide and everything on it, because if you get this right, you can screw up so many other things in your business and just like throw your excess money at the problem to sort it out. If you get it wrong, your business is gonna be stressful. So I promised you the title of this talk, Less Stress. Don't get this wrong. And, and you'll have less stress. Because your margins are wrong, you will have no cash, you'll have no time because you'll have to work super hard to earn money, and you'll have to work really long hours to earn the minimum amount you need. You'll not, you won't have any money left over to hire anyone to help you with all that work, and you won't have any money to hire advisors like, I have no idea who that might be, maybe. <laughs> um, if you get it right, you'll have plenty of cash for marketing, so you can get increasing amounts of sales. You have plenty of cash for growth projects that will grow your business. You'll be able to hire people ahead of your growth so you don't get that horrible crunch where you have to work really long hours and train someone new to try and save you from all that effort. You'll have plenty of money for managers so your business can actually get bigger than just you running everybody because you've got enough money to afford managers. You have plenty of money for all your other expenses, which I'm calling overheads, and most importantly, you. You'll have money to pay you a decent amount for all of your time and effort that you're putting in. So here's the magic number. The price that you charge your customers for your service or your product has to be at least three times the cost to deliver that product or service. So we're not, we're not including rent or your accountant fees or anything like this. We're just purely it's the cost to deliver. So if you sell products, it's all the raw materials, all the shipping from the beginning of time to when you get it to your customer. 
Uh, it's all the labor that's involved in this product or service. If you have an agency, uh, say you're doing web design, then it's the cost of your developers that do the work on the sites that you're selling. So keep this in mind, three times the cost to deliver. This is really important, so I'm, I'm going to say it again. The price is greater than three times the cost to deliver the service. If you're not in business yet, do this from the beginning, and it will save you so many headaches. Um, if you're relatively new in business, it might be a little challenging to, to raise your prices or cut your costs, or you might not know what your costs are. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. If you can get four times, well done. It can be a bit hard. Um, you need a bit of bravery and confidence to, to be able to, ha to have that. And you know, there's money mindset issues that come in, but it's very important if you can get this right. As your business grows bigger, you won't be able to keep the margins so high, unless, you say, you're a purely online business and you don't have to worry about rent and paying for big factories and things like that. You might be able to do it. Um, but don't feel bad if you know, you're sitting in here and you're a million plus annual revenue business and you don't have these three, three X margins. That's probably okay, but maybe come talk to me later. So number three key number is marketing spend. Marketing is really, really important, um, and it's very tempting not to spend any money on this. But if you don't, if you're spending too little, you won't know anything about your market. You won't be able to speak to them in a way that really works for them. Uh, you won't have any leads. No one putting their hand up and saying, hey, can we jump on a call and, and have a chat about how you can help us? Or you won't have anyone visiting your website and signing up to your email list. If you do get someone, uh, do get a lead, if your marketing spend isn't high enough, then you won't be able to convert them as easily. You'll be having hard conversations and you know, it'll feel like you suck at sales, but it's just because you suck at warming up them up with your marketing. So you know, don't worry about that. Um, and then the other thing you might not realize is if you're not spending enough on your marketing, your customers will be unhappy and leave because the promise you're making in your marketing or the promise you make in your sales to convert these hard leads, you may not be living up to uh, when you're actually delivering the product or service. So marketing is important, very important. If you spend too much on marketing, it is a bit of a Goldilocks thing. If you spend too much on it, then you're just wasting money, basically. You can't. It's for the same thing I talked about with the margins in the last slide. You won't have as much money for you and managers and, and all that sort of stuff. So the magic number for this is 5 to 15% of your sales. That's the magic number. Um, if you feel like you have to spend more, it's possible that you're in a competitive market, but it's also possible you're getting a terrible return on your marketing spend. Um, this range does depend on your size. Uh, in the beginning, you may be spending 15% just because you can't spend any less, like the minimum spend on a particular advertising method might be uh, uh, non-negotiable. It does depend on your industry. If it's more competitive, you may need to spend more or maybe you're one of the lucky ones that doesn't actually have to spend that much. You can just put up a few blog posts and maybe do some speaking opportunities. Don't know who would do that. Um, and it does depend on your business model as well. Uh, if anybody, is there anybody in here that's selling eBooks and training courses and things? Yes. Generally, you guys will spend quite a bit more on marketing because you've got less team and things to pay for. This guideline can also be used in the reverse. Instead of starting with your sales and working out what percentage your marketing is, you can do it the other way around. You can start with 5 to $15 of marketing spend, should get you at least $100 in sales. And um, so if you're currently spending a lot more than that on your marketing, um, maybe we can have a chat a little bit afterwards, or there's probably, are there any marketers in here? All right, and keep your hand up if I've like offended you with this percentage. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. <laughs> All right, key number number four is profit. I've been talking about profits and having more profits, um, but it's only number four because the, the other three there um, will affect the profit, and I want you looking at those first. Um, as you're growing in the beginning stages of a business or going through a growth phase, you might be spending a lot of money and turning yourself into a loss position, um, or if you're like a funded startup, most of them are just losses for days. Um, but if you've had a look at the other top three key numbers and you've worked out what the effect on profit is, all of those, the last piece that affects profit is all your other expenses. 
So if you're spending too much on rent, if you're spending too much on your admin team, if you're spending too much on your accounting fees or advisors, it's never can spend too much on that. Um, a key thing I want to leave you with here, I'll talk more about expenses later, but don't go nuts chopping them. Um, I, I know uh, as a former accountant, this is what we generally like to focus on, is just keeping your, profit, uh, your expenses down, but don't cut the important ones. Um, for profit, I usually say aim for 20% of sales as your profit figure. And the reason why I say that is because it gives you um, plenty of, of money for a few things that I will not skip ahead and tell you yet. Um, but make sure that that 20% is after you've been paid for your work. So consider that there's you the worker and you the person who owns the business asset. Your business needs to be able to pay you a market rate for the work you're doing. So if you have a web design firm and you're telling me that you've got this 20% of, of uh, sales as profit, but you're not paying yourself as you would another web developer, then it's um, yeah, deluding yourself a little bit. So it, it can be uh, very tempting to say, yes, I've done this, um, and, and not do the hard work of maybe working on your margins so that there's plenty of money left over. And you, the business owner, deserves to be paid as well. So you're holding a very risky asset. It's not like real estate, definitely not like stocks. It's, um, this asset could go up in smoke at any time, um, almost, it, it can feel like. It, it has to me a couple of times. Um, so you, the business owner, you need a return on that investment. Uh, otherwise, you should just sell it and move on to a different asset. So profit is important because here are all the things that profit does. It pays down debt. If you've got debts like a credit card or a loan, the interest portion comes off your profits. But the principal portion, the bit that actually lowers how much you owe, that comes out of your profits. So if you're really focused on keeping your profits low so you're not paying the tax office, then you're also not going to be able to pay your creditors. Savings also comes from profit. I mean, if you think about it, it's fairly obvious. Profit is the amount of income you haven't spent. So the amount of money you haven't spent turns into savings. You can also use it to reinvest in growth, and it's a return, like I said, for you, the owner. So profit is important. Um, try not to get too crazy about keeping your profit low to avoid paying tax. And then key number number five, is cash or cash flow. Um, I'm not going to tell you to go look at a fancy uh, statement of cash flows for this, um, but it's super important because if you don't have any cash, you don't have business. Uh, a business, you can actually go to jail if you can't pay your debts as they fall due. Uh, for anybody here operating through a company, should know about that. Um, so keeping cash and having more cash coming in than goes out on average, very important. And the key here is timing. So cash flow is different to profit because it's a timing thing. The dates on your invoices uh, and the dates on your supplier bills may show that you've got tons of profit, but if your customers aren't paying you um, or if you're paying your suppliers a little bit too early, that can mean that your cash flow is a totally different number. So if you've ever said to your accountant or bookkeeper, there's tons of profit on here, but I feel like there's no money in my bank account, well, Here's a few reasons why. Uh, you want to look at the balance sheet. The balance sheet, uh, the profit and loss has got your income, less your expenses and a profit. The balance sheet has your assets and liabilities. The amount other people owe you, or the assets you hold, and the liabilities is the amount you owe other people, like your suppliers, uh, your employees, the, the government. Have a look at the cash from customers. So the amount they owe you, so accounts receivable or debtors are the other names for it. Um, get money from them as soon as you possibly can. Get it all paid up front before you start work, if you can. Otherwise, some sort of deposit and instalment system or recurring revenue is even better, so you know the money's coming in. If you have an inventory business where you're selling products, don't order too much inventory because it's just like dollar bills sitting on the shelf. Uh, they're not really helpful to you. Um, be careful of over-investing in assets like desks, computers, um, cars, um, make sure that you've got enough cash to continue running your business. Cash to supplies is another thing. Um, 
pay them on time, but make that on time point as late as you can, which means you're holding onto the cash for as long as possible in case something terrible comes up. Definitely try to get into a situation where your customers pay you first and then you pay your suppliers and your team afterwards. Life is just so much easier if you do it that way. If you pay your suppliers and team first and then hopefully sometime your corporate client might pay you in the next six months, life sucks. You end up being an unofficial lender without any of the skills or training or large reserves of capital. Debt repayments. Uh, if you find you don't have cash but you've got plenty of profit, then it's probably debt repayments like high purchases and, and loans for cars and things. Uh, and tax and compliance, they're the other ways that your cash can run away. So the five key numbers, sales, margins, marketing, profit, and cash or cash flow. So the next section, I'm going to ask you to participate at the end of this one, I'm so sorry. Uh, this is about five quick ways to increase profit in the next week. So I'm going to there's five ways, five categories, and I want you to think about which of the categories. You don't, don't have to think about which specific way you're going to do that, but I want you to think about which of the five categories you're actually going to implement. For those of you that have businesses already, I'm going to ask for a show of hands at the end, and we'll see who's the brave ones that do number two. Number one, review costs. I know, an accountant telling you to keep your costs down, how surprising. Um, but it's really important because every dollar you don't spend is an extra dollar of profit. So don't waste money and you'll have more profit. Go through and do a review and there's a couple of questions you should ask. The first one is, is this expense necessary? Do we even need it? If not, you can cancel it or reduce it. The big, um, the big problem here is usually software subscriptions. Software subscriptions you've signed up for and you don't use or you don't use the number of users anymore. So every two or three months, just go through the list of them, all your credit card statement and cancel. Just be careful that you haven't committed to a year and they're going to charge you the rest of the year up front when you cancel. That's uh, something I did a couple of years ago. Um, the next question is, am I getting enough value out of this? Am I getting a good return on my investment? I'm spending money. Am I actually getting enough money back? Usually the solution is just for search for someone cheaper. But keep in mind the cost of switching. It might take you a little while to switch between systems like email marketing automation software. Sometimes there's a bit of an effort to, to switch over and make sure all your opt-in forms and things have properly gone across. So keep in mind uh, that time. Um, maybe this is the counterintuitive thing. Does anybody expect me to say this one? Maybe you might want to actually spend more on a particular expense. Uh, usually marketing is the culprit here. Um, but here's a phrase I want to leave you with off this slide. Don't throw money at a problem, throw it at a solution. And this is marketing, usually the big culprit here. I'm sorry for picking on marketing, all the marketing people out there. Um, so usually if someone has a sales problem or they don't have enough sales coming in, they want more money, they want more customers, they'll, they'll just throw a ton of money on marketing. But that's throwing it at the problem of sales. Throwing it at a solution would be spending a little bit of money to test a marketing channel to see if it works for you, and then throw money at it when you've worked out it is actually a solution. So spend more, yes, but don't throw money at a problem. Quick way number two, this is the one you've got to be brave to do, is to raise your prices. I know that there is an objection that's floating around your head, and I'm going to address that one. Um, but first. There, every dollar you, that you increase your prices is an extra dollar of profit. You haven't had to do anything extra to get that. Um, you don't have to raise your prices. You could just decrease your dis discount. Like a client of mine did a monthly blog writing service. And on her pricing page, she had $800 a month. And then it was a big red X. And it was actually 497 So I suggested to her, well, instead of changing the 800 just move the 497 up to 527 uh, still looks like a big discount. Uh, you can test your price increase on new customers who don't know what you normally charge and won't be as disgruntled. So you could test it and you, so you could see on a sales call or in person, you could see uh, how they react to that price. Here's the bit where I'm going to challenge you why you hate raising prices. Um, I wrote an article on my site. There's a link if you go through the slides. Um, but it, basically the concept is you can lose customers and still be more profitable. Um, I'm going to do a little math. I'm so sorry uh, to do it first thing in the morning after the after party, but we're talking about numbers. You're not going to get away with it. 
Um, imagine that you double your prices. So let's make it nice, easy round numbers. $1,000 in sales, maybe a week or a month or a year, whatever it is. $1,000, you double it, so your sales turn into $2,000. But then you lose half of your customers because they hate your new price. And off they go. So your sales are back down to 1000 again, right where we started. And, and so most people at this point go, well, that's great, Ben. Why did you put me through all that stress? I kind of like some of those people. The reason why is because even though your sales are the same, your cost of delivery is a lot lower. Like you have half the number of customers to fulfill. So you don't need quite so many staff, which means you might need, not need so many managers. Might mean you don't need quite so big an office or so many software subscriptions. So all of your costs will drop down. For the people who are selling physical products and have suddenly seen their quantity sold drop by half, um, that means less inventory, inventory you need to pre-order, which means less cash that's just sitting on the shelves doing nothing. So it can still work. And the reason why I put the link to my blog post in there is because maybe you don't want to double your prices. Maybe you want to put it up 10 or 20% instead. There is a table on that article that will show you um, how, how many customers you can afford to lose if you raise your prices a certain amount. If you're still worried, if I still haven't convinced you, and I probably haven't for a lot of you, I'm seeing worried faces. I got a couple of nods though, that was good. Um, you can offer increased value with a price rise. Um, you can say to people, you know, we love that you've been a customer, we're going to add this new extra service or throw in this new extra product, and we're gonna put our prices up. That's one way to make yourself feel better and potentially lose less customers. But I would suggest you should be increasing your prices at least every year for inflation. Most people are used to regular small increases and they're quite happy for that. Um, if you don't increase your prices for many years and then you need to jump them up 20, 25% after a few years, yeah, you're probably gonna lose some customers. Quick way number three to increase profits is to increase the order size. So you have spent time and money acquiring a customer. If they buy more from you, then you don't have to spend more money to acquire another customer. Um, there's two main ways that you can increase the order size. One is called cross-selling or add-ons. So they bought one thing from you and you sell them something else that's kind of related. Uh, you don't have to have that separate related product or service. You could have a partner or an affiliate or even white label somebody else's service or product. So you don't have to go through the whole product or service development process. You can also do upselling. So this is where you upgrade somebody who's bought something and you get them to buy a more premium something from you or more of the something. So there's a couple of ways. Um, GoDaddy is really, really good at this. If you try and buy a domain from GoDaddy, how many things do they try and cross sell and upsell like all the other dot something versions of the domains? They want your hosting, they want some emails. Um, Vistaprint is also ridiculously good at this. There's like 10 pages of the checkout before you can pay for your business cards. Um, you don't have to be them. You can just like maybe one extra thing um, can, can give you a bit of extra profit. Uh, quick way number four is to sell again. Like I said before, you spent time and money to acquire a customer and they bought from you and they're probably happy, yeah? So they're more likely to buy from you than a completely new customer is and it's also cheaper to sell to them. So that sale is more profitable. You could sell a recurring service then you don't need to market every month or every quarter or every year. You could sell a consumable product to them. Maybe it's not your main product is consumable, but there's, maybe there's an accessory or something that goes with it. If you think about printers, I don't really use a printer very often, but this is the classic example, is that the printer is ridiculously cheap and the ink is where the companies make all their money. And that seems to run out faster and faster somehow. And now the printers can tell us, your ink has run out, even though I can clearly see there's some ink in there. Not that I'm cheap or anything. <laughs> You can also sell an updated version of your something. Um, for people who do training courses, where you can sell them the new, brand new, updated for today version of your training course or your book. Or your product, maybe there's one you have that's more efficient in some way. Um, or maybe you've got, uh, for those who are doing web design, you can update somebody's website and it can be cheaper than building the thing from scratch. You just put a new WordPress theme on. You can also sell something new the people who've bought from you before. Maybe you send them an email survey and see how their, uh, um, 
going with your product and what more you could do for them or what gaps they have, and then you could sell something new. Uh, that survey I mentioned is, uh, there's a popular version of it called the ask method. Um, so if you want to Google that, if you want to do that. And then number five kind of has nothing to do with numbers and money. Quick way number five, productivity. And the reason why this is in here is because it's about getting more done with less time. Time is money. You're either paying yourself for your time or you're paying your team for your time. So the more you can get out of anybody's time without being nasty about it, um, then that's uh, more profits for your business. Uh, a couple of key things uh, I want to talk about here. Being efficient is doing a task really, really fast and quickly. Effectiveness is doing the right task. So I can sometimes be extremely efficient at social media. I'm doing that really, really fast, liking my friends and commenting on my friends and things like that, but that's not really going to do anything for my business. Well, maybe a little, but so it's not the most effective use of my time. Like uh, point number one um, about the expenses, I had a review process. You can do the same thing with your tasks. This is the framework I got from the four hour work week book by Tim Ferriss. Uh, it's a little over 10 years old now, but I love this framework. First one is you look at the task. Does it need to be done at all? If not, get rid of it. If you can't get rid of it, can you automate it? It's often faster, cheaper, and more accurate to automate things. So you may have all heard of Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R.com. That can connect all sorts of web services together and save you a bunch of time. If you can't automate it, delegate it. Get somebody cheaper or with a lower hourly rate to do it for you. Um, for you, or maybe there's some talented staff you have and you delegate the boring work that's uh, very mundane and doesn't require their skills to someone a bit cheaper. If you can't do any of these, then do it yourself, and this is where the efficiency bit comes in, as well as to the delegating bit. Make sure your team's efficient. So, excuse me, you can go through this uh, framework for your tasks and also for the tasks that your team does. So, here's the participation part. Which of these are you going to do in the next one to two weeks? So we've got review costs, raise prices, increase order size, sell again, or productivity. Can I get raised hands for anyone who's going to review their costs? Good, that's always the popular one, yeah. Any brave souls going to raise their prices? Oh, wow. Well done, guys. I love this crowd. Um, anyone going to increase their order size? Very good, yeah, always a few there. Anyone going to sell again to their customers who've happily bought from them? Yeah, very good. Anyone going to do the counterintuitive productivity exercise? Wow. Who put their hand up more than once? Good on you. That's, that's very good. I like it. All right, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening.